Welcome back to day two of uh, the Millennials Rising Summit. Thanks for coming. Uh, we have a panel here for you on millennials, work, and family. Uh, my name is Connor Williams. I'll be the moderator today. I'm a senior researcher in New America's Early Education Initiative, which means that uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about what government programs, public programs, the private sector, collaboration between the two can do to make things better for kids, uh, how we can improve their academic outcomes, how we can support their development, uh, how we can change their, their life trajectories for the better. And you know, I, I think about this all the time. It's what I'm paid to think about. This may seem obvious to you, but it's become increasingly obvious to me uh, that you can't do that right without thinking a lot about how to support families as well, especially uh, working families. So as I've been doing that work, uh, I also have this other hat, more important hat. Uh, and I'm a 31-year-old father of two, two toddlers. So I, I got to where I was thinking about outcomes for kids for a living on a daily basis, but on an hourly basis, thinking about how to make work and family and, and our broader life cycle, my wife and I, uh, make sense. So that's why I'm here and sitting in the moderator chair. Uh, I have a, an awful lot of th thoughts about this. Uh, let me just not hide the ball and tell you what my, my broad thesis is about millennials. And again, I say this as a millennial, although I'm like one of the old geezers in the cohort, right? I got 31, I remember the Berlin Wall falling, I remember the 88 election. Uh, and you know, most millennials are, are, they were in like fourth grade when September 11th happened. So I, I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that I can only sort of speak for millennials. But let me tell you about my thesis about millennials work and family. And, and I think the data bear this out as you've probably been seeing now over during the summit. Uh, it's that the old life cycle patterns about school, work, marriage, and children, are simply, they're not as effective as they used to be, and, and I venture to say almost entirely ineffective for a huge portion of, of the millennial generation. To say, that is to say that knowing when and how and where to, to go through each of those phases of life is really difficult right now. And that's in particular in the, the sense of, of the big three trappings of middle class life, right? Which are being able to save effectively for college for kids, a dignified retirement, and a mortgage in a decent school district. And so I say that from the data perspective, but, but now I'm gonna indulge you because you're welcome to the Beltway, right? Uh, I wanna talk about me. Uh, I'm a relatively privileged guy. I, 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 uh, I'm a white guy with a PhD and two master's degrees. Um, but I, you know, I came from a, a lower middle class background in, in Michigan. I went to college on, on heavily uh, need-based financial aid. My family, my, my wife and I are still paying off our undergraduate student loans. Uh, and you know, like I said, I, we more or less followed what was a pretty traditional life cycle pattern. Got married in our 20s, had two kids by the time we were 30, went to school, went to work. I have an unbroken employment record stretching back 20 years. I've been working since I was 11. Uh, I've had no, in addition to all the privilege, I've had you know, really no bad luck, no major bad luck. Uh, never uh, had to leave a job for health reasons, never had some sort of catastrophic accident that derailed me professionally. And despite that, despite all the privilege I've got going for me, despite all the like, things generally breaking in the not screwing up my life uh, way in terms of luck, uh, we still don't really know here at 31 with two kids how to make this traditional life cycle that we've chosen, you know, early marriage, early kids, how to make that work for those long-term savings priorities. I think we've got two out of three nailed down, but I don't really know yet. I don't see a path from where we are financially now to, to getting with that third together. And so I bring that up not to elicit sympathy from you because, again, let's be honest, right? My problems are not major league problems. Uh, again, white guy with a PhD and, and lots of privilege. But to point out that if someone like me, with all of that, it, those advantages is struggling, that ought to be a, another canary in the coal mine for, for the broader struggles that millennials are facing around work and family. If a guy like me isn't quite sure how to make the middle class equation work around work, family, and the life cycle, then, then we have some serious problems. So I, I'm the least interesting person on this stage, though. I could talk about this forever. We have a great panel here. I, I want to just tell you first quickly about the format we're going to use, and then second, uh, I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves. So 
we're going to spend another 10 minutes or so on introductions on the, each of the panelists talking about how their work intersects with what we're talking about on the panel. And then we're going to do 15, 20 minutes of questions from me, conversation up here. It's going to be as free-flowing as I can keep it. And then the last half hour, so hopefully, is questions from you. So that means we're counting on you for questions, because if I say any questions and nobody's hand goes up, then I get to keep talking. And I'm counting on you to make sure that doesn't happen. So uh, without further ado, let me just briefly introduce each panelist, and then they're, they're going to each talk in order going down the line. So we have Jessica Gross here from Slate. We have Donna Levin from Care.com. And then we have Carrie Gleason for the Center uh, for Popular Democracy. So Jessica, please. Hi, everyone. Um, so I am a writer for Slate, and I cover a lot of issues about <clears throat> work-life balance and child care. Um, and when I think about millennials and the future of care, um, I think when you talk about millennials, you just really have to talk about them in two different categories, which is educated millennials and millennials who are not educated and don't have those privileges. Because when you look at their uh, experiences of care and their difficulties with caregiving, it's really two different ball games. So I'll tell you two sort of anecdotal stories um, that I think illustrate the different problems everybody's facing. So um, I am the mom of a two-year-old, and we had a hangout with some people in our building. And uh, both couples, both of the other couples had kids and they were in the exact same scenario, which was that both wives worked in finance and ended up were now stay-at-home moms and neither really wanted to be, but their options were work 12-hour days and never see their kids uh, or not work at all because there was no part-time, there was no flex time, there was no consulting in their specific fields. Those just were not options. Uh, and so I think it's a huge loss to have women like them not contributing, not just for themselves, it's not an individual loss, but it's a societal loss when you have that brain drain uh, because the, and it's, again, you know, this is, the statistics bear this out. Uh, when that brain drain happens, it's mostly women who are stepping back. You know, their husbands are still working those still, you know, long hours, but um, the, whether it's it's a combination of individual and cultural choice, that women are the ones who end up having to step back. So that's sort of the educated picture. And then the from women and men, lower down the socioeconomic co cohort, um, because many of them have what's called just-in-time scheduling, which is, you know, they don't know when they're going to be working week to week, so that's women often in food service and in uh, many caregiving, uh, like nursing home, uh, certified nursing assistants. Uh, they have, it's impossible for them to arrange child care in any kind of way, and uh, often they will not have paid sick days or any kind of paid leave, and so them getting sick, their kid getting sick, that can mean the difference between you know, their family eating and their family not eating. Uh, they and they're losing jobs, and then and that is just dreadful. I mean, and that's they're they're not managing to care for their kids at all. Um, and so I see those as sort of two separate problems. I think we were talking a little bit before, and we're all a little afraid that this panel is just going to be a huge bummer for everyone. So I will, I will say that for women and men lower down the socioeconomic co cohort, I do think that there are fixes that if we can get together and have them change on, on a societal level, like, again, paid sick leave, which should not be as hard a sell as it is in this country. I mean, every other country has paid sick leave. Um, and things like, you know, Paid, paid parental leave, you know, even just six weeks, which is what the Family Act, uh, which is the Paid Parental Leave Act uh, um, that they're trying to pass on the federal level. Just things like that passing will help everyone, but especially uh, men and women down the socioeconomic cohort. Um, the, I, I think there's tons of policy minds that are, are better than mine trying to figure out fixes for the two working parent problem that I described among men and women of the higher socioeconomic cohort. And uh, I do a series called Child Care Over There for Slate, which is uh, interviewing men and women in other countries about how their child care works. And even in the social democracies that we all look to as you know, ideal child care scenarios like Norway and Sweden, 
when I interview these men and women, it's not perfect for them. Uh, it's still often a struggle, especially when there's a sick kid or any sort of event out of the ordinary. Somebody has to stay home. Someone has to pick up the slack. And it can you know, be detrimental to their careers. And so um, obviously, it is a lot nicer to be a mom in Norway than it is here. But it's still, there's no, like Connor was saying, there's no perfect fix to this life cycle problem that we haven't quite figured out. So um, that's, that's it. <laughs> Great. So Donna Levin uh, from Care.com. Uh, we are uh, a marketplace that brings together families who are looking for caregivers with providers in their local area. And we prov have providers across the lifespan. So child care, senior care, uh, special needs care. We have um, roughly somewhere over 11 million members uh, in 16 countries. And we're very uh, focused on how do we uh, professionalize this caregiving industry. Um, because what we foresee is a care crisis as more and more uh, families um, have to work. So with 60% you know, of two uh, parent households uh, needing to have dual incomes uh, with most single moms. Uh, I think those numbers are slightly off in the last data that I received that said only 40% work. I think that number is probably higher. Um, and when we pull back and take a look at our member base, one of the conversations we were having before we came out here was sort of this expansive definition of a millennial, and that maybe there are two segments of millennial. You know, Connor considers himself sort of the older end of the millennial, and then there's sort of the younger end of the millennial um, up to sort of age 18. When we take a look at our member base, we see with our care seekers uh, probably skewing towards the older end of the millennial base being about 45% percent uh, of our members. Um, and then when we take a look at our providers, it skews across both segments. So millennials make up over 50 percent of our member base. And the interesting thing, uh, if we take a look at our providers on millennials, um, a lot of them highly educated. Uh, they have their undergraduate degrees. Um, they could not find work. They're taking some time off. They're working as a nanny. Um, while they're thinking about going to grad school, or they're graduate students um, who are also providing care to make ends meet. Um, looking forward to sharing some additional data with you on sort of the differences that we're seeing uh, with caregiving as it relates to millennials um, and their parents. So, um, I don't know. Is that better? OK. So, uh, I am the director of the Fair Work Week initiative, and so we're working hard to figure out solutions to the challenges that we're all facing in our working time. Um, something to think about, right, is that the last time we actually passed public policies that addressed the challenges we're facing around working time was 75 years ago. And I think we can all agree that today's work week is radically different than what it is 75 years ago and even you know, 15 years ago if we think about the rise of just-in-time scheduling. Um, there is a movement right now to actually think about what are the solutions that we need for today's work week. Um, that's a part of the work I do at the Fair Work Week Initiative. Um, one of the things I also want to kind of, as context before we start to dig in on what are the solutions, um, I think that, that you had already laid out some of the trends, um, but that actually the majority of Americans today are getting paid by the hour. Three in five Americans are getting paid by the hour. The majority isn't salaried workers. Um, and it might not, I mean, it'd be interesting to survey us in the room how that, how that lays out, right? Because whether or not you're getting paid by the hour or by salaried um, does follow along whether or not, you know, what kind of education you have. Though increasingly we're seeing what happens to academic jobs or freelance, what's happening to the, the reporters, um, you know, across journalism, um, even in professional jobs or the lawyers, right? Professional jobs are even increasingly paid by the hour. Um, and then if we look at what are the industries that are growing, well, most of the job growth is in the lower paid 
jobs. It's retail and restaurants. And the quality of those jobs is even declining even more rapidly. They're part-time, no benefits, and, and less and less of a career path. And I know many people who you know, get a college education and then go back to their retail or restaurant job while they look for their career job. And, and that time in those jobs is going longer and longer. And so the idea that these jobs are stopping points, I think we need to kind of reconsider that. The other question is, right, so if we think about what is the job growth, well, it's a lot of it is part-time work. The majority of the job growth last year was part-time jobs. 40% of millennials are underemployed, right? And so the, the world between being employed and having that job security and having no income more and more of us are in this gray area. And, and, and it's scrambling, right? And, and we're all, even for the ones that are employed, if you're in some of these sectors that are more fluid, that are trying to micro-adjust according to the working time, not giving you a permanent contract, you're one step away from being a part of that 40% that of underemployed. Um, and then if we think about working time, right? We're all working by the hour. It's not really a job today. It's a transaction paid by the hour, um, increasingly mediated by online tools like care.com. Um, some people say blame the technology for, for work just in time scheduling and I think that the technology can be a part of the solution and the tools. The question is do we have the power to mediate with that technology? What are the protections we need to reimagine how this technology could be creating the future of work that we need? Um, and one last point before I'll stop is just that when we think about work as becoming a transaction paid by the hour and we think about our overall economic picture, um, well, productivity is output per hour. I'm not an economist, so correct me if I'm, I'm interpreting and understanding this differently, but I, my understanding is that productivity is growing, um, hours are shrinking, and hours are becoming more uncertain. And so for us as people who are working and thinking about um, our labor is giving us certainty and, and being able to project our future, um, we're, we're producing more, right? We're like, we're productive, we're multitasking, but what we're, it's not, it's not resulting into more economic stability for us. So again, we're trying our best to not make this a, an overwhelmingly pessimistic or depressing <laughs> panel, however, uh, I don't think there's any, there's, there's really no doubt that the, the picture right now for millennials broadly construed is, and, and certainly within specific demographics, is, is not, not an encouraging one for work and family. And so I, I want to ask, Jessica, I want to ask you, in part of like drilling into this, these demographics, because again, we know that not all millennials have the same problems, right? Uh, and I, I think it's, it's sort of obnoxious to talk that way even, right? But I want to start with you to ask about gender a little, because you, you touched on that, right? If we're talking about the demographics of, of how millennials are challenged by having a family, having a dignified life with their family, and working, I mean, how does gender play into that? Well, I mean, the biggest way gender plays into that is, I think, the latest statistics are that 40% of children are born to single mothers. And so the brunt of the care, uh, it falls on their shoulders. Uh, and, and, you know, the way that our welfare laws are structured, they are all put push back into the workforce as soon as possible. Uh, and that is just untenable. I mean, it is, it results in situations, and I, I think this woman is probably older than a millennial, but uh, there's a big story earlier this year, a woman named Deborah Harrell worked at McDonald's, had a single mom, had to, someone had to watch her kid, it was the summer, um, so her kid wasn't in school, so she let her kid go to the park by herself. Girl was nine, you know, that's, you know, old enough, I think. Well, anyway, that's debatable. So she, uh, someone found out that the girl was going to the park by herself, and uh, the mother got arrested. The girl was sent to social services. Uh, I think it's ultimately been resolved. I think the girl is back with her mother, but the fact that that is what had to happen is appalling. Uh, and so I think that's sort of one major way it plays in. Um, but then the other way is, again, you know, I mean, I think uh, the book Lean In is obviously something that always comes up in these discussions. And I think it's, it's a great service to encourage women to, you know, go for whatever they want. But I think it, that neglects the fact that women 
who are married and who are ambitious are, are still running into the same problems that they were running into 20 years ago. I mean, I read, I read in my research, I end up stumbling on articles, you know, from the New York Times or Time Magazine that were written in, you know, 1987, and they could have been written yesterday. I just don't think that there's been any real progress in terms of uh, in dual income couples, women sort of bearing the brunt of the childcare, and so. Yeah, again, we're, we're being such a bummer. <laughs> but, no, I, yeah, that is how gender plays into it in sort of two ways. Well, and to be, a, as a, a father who was a primary caretaker for two years with, with uh, my kids, one of the things that I've been, I've been challenged by is, uh, right, there's lots of good data showing right now that mothers and fathers alike, men and women alike in the United States, are spending more time generally on both caregiving and breadwinning, right? That there's less and less free time. There's Everybody's putting in more uh, as as they become parents. Whether or not the equity is, is quite there is another question, right? Whether or not fathers are on average doing as much as mothers when you add all the hours up is, is a hotly debated and, and I think generally speaking, we the dads are not holding up our end of the bargain. But it's true that right, equity is even harder when you're talking about working to the point of exhaustion, right? Once everybody's wiped out, trying to get somebody to do a little bit more to get to equity is, is a, it's a really tough lift. Well, I would also say that and I think something that I think people are afraid to talk about because it doesn't want to sound gender essentialist, but uh, I think it needs to be said that women, especially with very small children, can be really physically exhausted in a way that makes it hard for them to really be incredibly ambitious when their children are small. So it's, you know, you just gave birth, you're maybe still breastfeeding, and you don't get the proper leave or the proper time to pump or whatever you need. And so if it becomes a decision where, you know, someone needs to sort of step back from their career, um, I think it can often be a decision that's made not out of any sort of desire that the mother wants to you know, spend more time with the kids than the father does, but it can often be a decision that's made out of just sheer exhaustion. And I think that's sort of something that, you know, it, it, it's always said like, oh, women, you know, they just want to spend more time with their children, but I think that that's a factor that sort of doesn't get discussed enough. Can I touch upon that? Please, yeah. please. Um, I think there are two factors um, at play there. So uh, hands down, any household uh, with newborns, parents are exhausted, uh, particularly if also there's a mom at play. Um, I do think for a number of women who do go back to the workplace, and let's you know focus on sort of those uh, professionals in a salaried position, um, there's a thing that happens to mom and there's a thing that happens to dad. So if mom is Jane, uh, when Jane goes back to the workplace after giving birth to a child, there is an inherent assumption that uh, Jane is more involved in caregiving. So if there's a stretch opportunity, uh, the leadership usually thinks, you know what? Jane's just getting back. Let's ease her into it. Don't give her the stretch opportunity. If dad, let's call him Joe, goes back to work, uh, for Joe, the perception is, way to go, Joe. <laughs> You're a parent now. He is in. He is committed. Give him the stretch opportunity, because he's going to go knock it out of the park. Um, so when it's time to take a look at sort of who gets promoted, Jane does not get promoted because there's a perception that Jane, you know what, she's stressed, she's working on this, but Joe does get promoted. So I just wanted to touch upon sort of those two yeah. factors um, at play. And well, it's all, I mean, but it's all like, I think everybody needs to be treated as an individual, and that's part yeah. of this problem. You know, it's like, yeah. it's, it's um, some women are gonna need longer to physically recover, and some women are gonna, you know, have the baby and the next day be like, so when do I get back to work? Like, feel amazing. And so the, there's not enough sort of wiggle room um, in our perceptions and our, I mean, and at this point in our laws to, to sort of accept both those things. And I think, um, you know, I'm also a young mom, yeah. <laughs> or new mom, I'm not young, <laughs> as, as 
in comparison to others. But, but um, you know, if we think about these questions around um, like a voice in our schedules, right? So it's the idea of like if you want to be able to ensure that you can accommodate your work schedule according to what you need, all of our circumstances are totally different, right? Um, there was really new. There was new data that came out. It was the National Longitudinal uh, Survey of Youth. So it was a survey of millennials. And what's interesting about it, it's the first ever national survey that studied uh, work schedules, right? The rise of unstable schedules, unpredictable schedules. And, and the country is actually now looking to this data to think about what's happening across at, at labor markets across the board, because it was the first time we had representative data. Um, so it's interesting, right, to think about all the millennials in the room and what your experiences are around your working time are actually informing public policy on the federal, local, state level, um, because there's an absence of data. Our tools aren't, aren't we're not actually measuring the stuff um, that is impacting our lives, right? Um, and, but in this data, it found that, and there's like fact sheets and materials out there if you're interested to get paper. Um, 50%, regardless if you, if you worked full time or hourly, 50% of people said they had no input into their schedule, right? Yet, unpredictability is on the rise. Um, the majority of people, it was, I think, what was it, 75% said that they had, I didn't get to print my own paper, I think it was 75% said that they had fluctuations in their hours. And if you were working part time, if you're one of those underemployed people, that number skyrocketed even higher. Um, for part time workers, um, they said 87% that said that, no, 85% said that their schedules, they experienced some fluctuations, and, and, they, and the majority of those workers had no input to their schedule. And those fluctuations were by 87% weekly from month to month. So what this means, right, it's not just that your income is massively fluctuating, it's that your time is max massively fluctuating. What does this mean for care? What does this mean for being able to like budget, do other things, be a productive human being in this world? And I think that, um, so what's interesting, though, to think about it, right, a lot of people do in the policy world, public policy world, are saying, well, you know, the problem of just-in-time scheduling of Jeanette Navarro at Starbucks and, and of um, Anne-Marie Slaughter that, that she faced, they're just two different problems. We need to think about two separate solutions. What's interesting as we're thinking about what are the public policy solutions is actually, if you think about the core of the problem, right, of what Jeanette Navarro experienced and Anne-Marie Slaughter struggles with, actually it could be the same solution um, when you come to public policy levers. Um, and I think that's kind of exciting. How do we think about a world in which we're talking about what all working people are facing? Many of these solutions actually are, are the same. Really? Yeah. That's fascinating. This is actually the next question I was going to ask you was sort of a socialist question, right? If so much of our job growth is coming in part-time, low-wage work, should we be focusing on better care options that make it possible to work these really, you know, really inadequate jobs, or should we be focusing on the problem of creating really inadequate jobs? But it, I mean, so it sounds like what you're suggesting is that it turns out, right, the policy levers here could be beneficial across, and not just for those jobs. Yeah, so um, one of the solutions is, um, you know, we shouldn't be required to work any hours in which we're not scheduled. Mm -hmm. So you get a schedule, right? So the first part of the solution is you actually get a schedule. You know the end time in the beginning, the start time and the end time, right? That's radical. Most of us don't have that protection, right? And then you'd have the right to say, not that you can't be working beyond those working hours, but you'd have the right to say, I can't. Mm -hmm. um, with, and be protected from retaliation when you say that you can't. Right, and then if a employer really wants to be able to have people work last minute, which many of them do, well then you can also offer an additional like predictability pay. Well, give me an extra hour of pay. Give me some extra added incentive. If you want, if this kind of flexible time is so valuable to the employer, then there's no reason why they can't pay for it, right? We have overtime protections, time and a half. Why can't we have predictability pay or flex time pay, right? And so that's, that's some of the solutions we're thinking about. Uh, there's, there's, there are solutions around having a voice into your schedule, right? That we could require employers to, to just solicit input from their workers on their schedule and, and have a good 
but, you know, good faith attempt at accommodating that input. Um, you know, these are some of the solutions, right? Can we offer core hours, right? We think about minimum wage. Can we have minimum hours? Um, sure. Donna, I want to see if you've got thoughts on this, too, because I know you, you mentioned that uh, one of the things that's happened with care now is that there are a lot of I say millennials, but a lot of new parents right now are looking for care in ways and in sort of fluid ways that they weren't before. I mean, what do you think about this? Absolutely. So um, we also know from the data that uh, less than a third of millennials actually plan on working traditional hours. Uh, it could be because of the demand. Um, I think it's also because we are so connected as a society. Um, so they are looking for flexibility. Um, they are doing shifts. They're uh, doing off hours. So a lot of the traditional forms of care of, uh, you know, you can do a drop off at a, a child care center from this time, they don't apply and they don't necessarily work. Um, so I do, that's, that's the rise of, you know, services like care.com and others that uh, try and provide uh, different types of options. I think the other uh, difference that millennials are also facing, um, I'm sure uh, uh, most of us were shocked by the USDA study that said, you know, it's going to cost $245,000 to raise a child today, um, <laughs> and that doesn't include college. Um, what um, our own data also says that, um, you know, the average family, 18% of their income is going towards care, that care is their largest um, expense. So um, they're looking for uh, flexible solutions, they're looking for creative solutions. Um, this notion of uh, a nanny um, is no longer uh, viewed as something as a, a luxury. Uh, that's something that wealthy people do. If you have uh, two young children and you're considering a daycare solution that's going to run you, you know, three to four hundred dollars a week, it might be cheaper to actually hire a nanny to help care for uh, your children. So we're seeing some of those changing trends um, that more people are looking for in-home care solutions uh, because they can't afford the other uh, more traditional. And the other one that we're seeing is a big push, and I, I'm sure it's covered in uh, the booklet I was uh, reviewing on the plane as well. Um, they're looking towards their employers. So the same way that we are looking towards a policy solution and some of the uh, policy solutions are really trying to prod employers to do different things, uh, from the likes of you know, your Googles to your Facebook, they are looking for benefits um, for their employees to provide them with different flexible uh, caregiving options from uh, subsidies to in-home care. And um, we think a lot about the sandwich generation of being people, I'm not a millennial, I am probably the traditional uh, family or sandwich generation. Uh, but what we're seeing is that people think of the sandwich generation as uh, someone like myself. So I have two kids, a five-year-old and a 12-year-old. And I also have my uh, mother living with me. Um, it's not because she needs end-of-life care. Um, it's because she's on that caregiving uh, continuum. What we're seeing is that it's also touching millennials. So for that older uh, uh, segment of the millennial base who have their young uh, families and are really just starting to get uh, going. Uh, even if their parents are still in the workforce, they're also involved if there's uh, a diagnosis uh, with one of their parents, if there's uh, some scary testing that's going on that's also impacting uh, their ability uh, at home and in the office. So employers are also uh, being asked to help figure out is there some other benefit outside a, a traditional EAP that can help me also address some of these other challenges? Sure. I'm going to let Jessica weigh in in a moment, but I just want to tell you that we're going to go to Q&A in a moment, so get those questions ready. Um, yeah, I mean, I think elder care is sort of a looming problem for us as a country. I mean, when you're talking about policy problems, I think Childcare is obviously a huge one, but um, demographically, 
I, I'm sort of terrified when I think about all the baby boomers retiring and how that is going to be something else that strains millennials and sort of prevents them from, as Connor was saying before, you know, uh, gaining that financial foothold and paying, you know, paying back their college loans, buying buying homes. I mean, it's just going to that. I, I think in many areas we're just. Kick it, we keep kicking the can down the road of, of responsibility. And it just all seems to, unfortunately, seem like it's going to fall on millennials' shoulders. So uh, that's also a concern that I think about a lot. And um, in terms of caregiving, you know, traditionally, a lot of families relied on grandparents uh, or you know, aunts and uncles, whatever, to help. But increasingly, again, because of the way that the economy has gone, those grandparents are still working. So um, again, you know, a lot of people that I've interviewed for these, this child care series, especially in other countries um, that had sort of more traditional trajectories, um, all of their parents are still working. And so, especially, you know, when you have a crisis inflection point where, you know, your kid is sick, you're sick, there's schools canceled because there's a weather event, but you still have work. They don't have that built-in backup, even if they do have childcare, of a family member coming to help because everybody's working longer and more hours, which, you know, is what you were speaking to as well. Yeah. So, millennials sinking. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I'm being a little glib. But look, uh, I'd love to hear what you have to think about or have to say about this. Uh, quick ground rules, please state your name and any affiliation you might have that's brought you here. Second is please ask a question and promptly, if it gets 30, 40 seconds and, and there's no question coming, I'm going to cut you off. So questions, please. Ah, right up here. Hi. Um, Oshara, St. Louis Fed. Um, somebody mentioned that 40% of kids are now born to single moms. Of course, if you're not educated, it's twice that. And the growth has been mostly among parents without an education. And of course, uh, folks like Bell Sawhill, Robert Putnam, Brad Wilcox have been talking about this. Their concern is not necessarily a moral one, that we have the rise of kids being born uh, without two parents, it's the concern for the kid. Um, and I was just wondering if the panel could say a little bit more about, you know, what kind of supports can employers and policymakers offer, especially to single moms without educations, uh, both for their benefit and for the kids? Yeah. Can, can I Please, So I think that um, there's a lot of solutions out there, so I actually don't, I think this is this moment. This summer, actually, we saw the introduce of groundbreaking legislation, the schedules that worked act in Congress. Uh, San Francisco is advancing many of these policy solutions. Next year, we're going to see multiple cities and states introduce uh, new policy protections around caregiving, uh, around work hours. We're actually at this very exciting moment where employers are, workers are speaking out, putting pressure on their employers, and employers are responding because you can't justify that a mom shouldn't be able to stay employed and should have to wake her kid up at 3 in the morning or, uh, you know, piece together care through friends and family. I mean, we've seen, I think the, the supports out there are outdated, right? When we think about child care subsidies, uh, I was speaking with one Starbucks mom in Pen Chester, Pennsylvania, um, Allison Santana, and she had child care subsidies, right? She was able to access child care subsidies as a single mom, and because of her unpredictable Starbucks schedule over which she had zero control, the, the child care subsidy uh, system actually pushed her off child care subsidies, right? And so when you have minimum income requirements and our social safety net, right, uh, whether it's um, FMLA or child care subsidies or, you know, the, the full range of them really do, yet our incomes are fluctuating and we have no control over that, it's really tough. I, Nurse Jackie, actually, just I'm catching up on my Nurse Jackie. She actually had that, right? She needed to, in order to, in her child custody battle, she needed to get a more predictable, stable schedule as a, as a condition. And the truth is, is that it's really tough. Um, and so I do think within some of these policy solutions, there are there is um, some consideration of high priority categories, right? That the, the federal bill that Elizabeth, Senator Elizabeth Warren introduced and Representative George Miller introduced um, 
basically said, everyone has the right to request and not be retaliated for requesting that, um, requ requesting a scheduling accommodation. But that if you're in a high priority category, if you're a student, if you have a second job, if you have a family or other caregiving responsibilities, that actually the employer has to um, accommodate that request. And there was a whole bunch of uh, exceptions for the employer so that it didn't provide an undue hardship, but that there is actually, if we want to address problems of occupational segregation uh, for women, if we want to think about uh, what black and Latino workers, workers of color, immigrant communities are facing where you have more responsibilities, less support, less wealth to tap into, um, you actually, we need these solutions if we want to be serious about addressing these kinds of inequalities. Yep. And I would add, just starting uh, at the very beginning, an example of paid leave. Um, in so uh, many cases, uh, that single mom, let's say she's a, a nanny, um, she wouldn't be paid for the time that she went off to go have her own child. Um, in cases where uh, there can be remote working, you know, we have a, a very large uh, workforce, uh, mostly moms who work from home, where uh, employers can offer the opportunity uh, for single moms to work remotely. Um, I believe we should. And um, I do agree that the current definition of subsidies is outdated um, and that we should move more to more of an allotment uh, model on those subsidies so that they can find a type of care uh, that actually works for them, even if that is, you know, uh, paying uh, a grandparent as a caregiver um, or hiring someone else that can help them out. Other questions? Uh, we've got a few right here. In fact, why don't we gather both of these questions, too? We have about 10 minutes left, so I want to make sure we hear as many voices as we can. All oh, right, Mike coming in from the back. Hi, I'm Sarah Lewis from the AFL-CIO. Um, I'm hearing a lot of great sentiments um, in this panel and previous panels. Um, the one thing that concerns me is I've heard the word workers twice in this entire time, and it's only in relation to people of color and not in relation to anyone else. Um, I've also heard a lot about caregivers, but um, only once about their rights as workers. One thing I have only heard from Sarah Obello is the word union. 80 some years ago, we were given the right to organize and to enforce our own rights and interests at the workplace, but this hasn't been spoken about the entire time. And um, I know most of you who are on this panel are sympathetic to workers' rights and workers' right to have a voice and to control, uh, try to control their own situation, their wages, their hours, and other circumstances of work. Um, I wanted to point that out, and I also would invite you to um, talk about how these issues of care and flex work, of um, health care and other benefits are not being addressed now, and what actually happens when you have a union on the workplace. And the, uh, I know my friend at CPD is going to be good at this one, so I'll be quiet now and let you talk. Thank you. Well, Jessica, don't well, I mean, the reason I can tell you, you know, I'm not an ex I, I can't speak to, you know, what unions, how unions can help because I'm not an expert in that. But I mean, I can say that I, the reason I don't bring up unions is because I'm not confident in their future in this country. I mean, and that saddens me deeply. But I mean, if you've looked at any trends in any state, it's all been to break unions. It's all been to bust unions. And so I think looking to unions as a future solution is not realistic in this particular moment. I mean, I'm sad to say that, but I just don't think that uh, imagining a scenario in which that is the solution to this great problem is, is not going to happen. I mean, you look at Kentucky, where auto workers were given the chance, Volkswagen auto workers were given the chance to form a union, and they said they didn't, what is the, what's the, they, they didn't form the union, though. I mean, I just think that it's not. But this, yeah. I mean, exactly. I mean, it, it's not positive for like the formation of unions either. Whatever happened, the union didn't didn't happen. Whatever they voted against it. I mean, it's not. We're not moving towards that. And so, I mean, the reason that I don't talk about it as 
a solution is because I just it's it's not where the trends seem to be lying. So um, so in Tennessee, um, I was actually there in Tennessee at the time I was driving uh, down, and we saw billboard after billboard about how voting yes for the union would be a job killer, right? And so it's a politicized process today to organize a union, and so uh, while the employer was actually remaining neutral, was in support of worker uh, was neutral to workers choosing the union, the elected officials in that landscape were not. And there was a, a massive earned media campaign that, that did not create a neutral environment for those workers to, to have that election. And actually, the UAW is working with uh, Volkswagen to explore uh, alternatives, right? And I think the question is, what is, I mean, I've, I've been a union organizer, right? I've helped workers in retail and hotel, and tel, hotel industry organize workers. In New York City, it's a good middle class job if you, if you are a unionized hotel worker. They earn over $30 an hour, have guaranteed health insurance, have protections, have a union that will fight for them. It's a, you know, if you're, un, you should be trying to get into the hotel industry in New York City and join their union. Um, in retail, there is also a massive difference, right? And a lot of these policy solutions Right, the Macy's Union in, in New York City was able to really negotiate on the integration of these workforce technologies, and was actually able to give workers like more voice and more say through through bargaining and the technology. And so I don't. Um, I think that we need to think about new strategies to create on ramps for workers to organize. And I think that it's that actually the more rights that workers have, the more power they have, the more protection they have to be able to think about collectively addressing the problems that they all face at work. Right. The part of the problem is that that. There's all these things that are happening in today's workplace, no matter whether you're a, a worker in a law firm or a worker in a fast food joint, and there's just, it's all legal, it's all fine, right? But just because it's legal doesn't mean that it's fair. And so part of what we do need is more protections for all of us in the workplace, and then we can begin to imagine what it means for us to actually have representation and democracy in the workplace. Um, so I don't think it's one or the other, and I think it is a part of the solution for sure. So we, uh, and we think about professionalizing the caregiving industry and uh, so the movement here on um, sort of trying to pass the Domestic Worker Bill of Rights and uh, different states and there's been some success um, but it's moving really slowly. I think maybe four states so far uh, have passed uh, with a, a fifth one on the, the docket. Um, and I think there are a, a few different challenges and the Domestic Worker Bill of Rights would uh, give protections to uh, workers who work in the home. So your nanny, uh, your house cleaner, anyone who is providing services uh, inside of someone's home. Um, as much as we support it, I think one of the big challenges is it's the same thing if you ask someone if they're a family caregiver. Most of us would not self-identify as a family caregiver. And um, a lot of the nannies, housekeepers, who uh, provide services uh, through care.com and others would not immediately identify themselves as a domestic worker and to make the connection that this bit of um, legislation that just passed actually applies to them. So I think there's a, a bit of heavy lifting that we also have to do on uh, communicating uh, the information and letting people why it's in their best interest uh, to either get actively involved um, or to learn more about it. Sure. Now, just a few minutes left, and so I, was, I flagged you two in the middle, but I'd like to collect another question over here as well. Just yeah. read a lightning round for the last couple of questions, please. Great. Hi, uh, Raquel Ortega. I'm with Unite for Reproductive and Gender Equity, URGE. And um, I just wanted to ask, over the past few years, we've seen a lot of restrictions on, um, an increase in laws on restrictions to um, a, an individual's decision whether to have children, not have children, to parent the children we have, right? A lot of restrictions on access to abortion, access to contraception, and while we've seen some progress with marriage equality, there's still a lot of restrictions in terms of LGBTQ couples being able to adopt. And so I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about that, how it affects young people, and what young people are doing in response. And my, my question was already that I Excellent. Okay. One more question right here uh, in the red sweater. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I thought I saw your hand. All right. Well, so 
let's just take that question then. So restrictions to family planning, millennials work in family. Um, well, the sort of divide between pro-choice and pro-life is something that is unfortunately not budging in the way that uh, attitudes towards gay marriage are. So I think uh, they're sort of two separate issues. And uh, I think in terms of millennials' attitudes towards uh, LGBTQ rights, I think that is the legislation is only going to continue to move forward on that front. I mean, if you look at all of the statistics, millennials are vastly in favor of, of, of giving the full spate of rights. And so I think once the you know, older generations sh stop being in power, we're going to see a lot of movement forward pretty even more quickly than what we're already seeing. Um, in terms, I mean, I am deeply troubled by anti-choice legislation that is continuing to be passed on the state level. And, uh, you know, I think that there are young people, there's a lot of uh, organizing that's happening on the grassroots level in terms of, of uh, pro-choice activists, but I think uh, they face a real, a, a sort of bigger uphill battle because uh, they're there's still a lot of pro-life sentiment. And um, Kathy Pollitt's book, Pro, which just came out, is really trying to uh, recapture the language around choice. And I think movements like that will only help to the good. But um, uh, in terms of contraception and family planning, obviously, there's been a couple of Supreme Court decisions recently that have been a huge blow. And so I, I, I think it kind of remains to be seen where that's going. We have very little time left. Did anybody else like to weigh in on that? No. So then scary. let me uh, just close by saying that I've been thinking, I had really enjoyed our conversation. I've been thinking a lot about this in the context of the old American progressives uh, about 100 years ago. Uh, they, they repeatedly were accused of trying to go beyond America, leave America behind, make it un-American. Uh, with the, the policies they were proposing to regulate an industrializing economy and, and a changing uh, society. And, and, and they always claimed, and, and I think this was consistent with what they thought they were doing, what they were doing, was that what they were trying to come up with was new policies to, to actually resuscitate old American values, new ideas that could make the American promise, the American dream, the American way of life real again in a new economic moment. And I don't think there's a whole lot of, I don't think it's especially controversial to say that we're dealing with something like that again right now, and especially around work and family issues in the United States. So how can we rebuild the American dream in a way that we have caregiving available, caregiving policies that support you know, humane and dignified breadwinning in the United States? That's an open question. and I don't think we've figured it out yet. And it's also really another way of just asking how can we rebuild the, uh, the American dream today? So. Uh, it's not really just a millennial problem, obviously. Any of you who hope to retire soon and take Social Security and draw other old age benefits in the United States need millennials to keep paying taxes and advancing in their careers. This is a national problem, and I hope you'll stay tuned at New America while we wrestle with it. Thank you.